Thank you all for coming to this uh, wonderful uh, community inter uh, interoperability panel. How is everyone feeling this morning? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're not feeling. Woo. Okay. No, I mean, I'm glad to see honest here. This is good. Uh, so I guess maybe to start off, how about you, uh, all of us kind of introduce ourselves and the uh, communities that we represent? Sure. Um, my name is Josh Whitehart. Um, I'm the Vice President of Marketing Business Development for Zcash, or, or actually for the Electric Coin Company, which is the inventor and supporter of Zcash. Um, well, okay. My name is Jay Kwan, um, and I am the co-founder of Tendermint and the Cosmos Project. Um, I don't represent the Cosmos Project, but I support it. And Terry Culver, CEO of Ethereum Classic Labs. So first question is um, a challenge question. Um, do we think that it's e in the long run even possible to have uh, enough multiple coin communities peacefully interoperating? Or as the maximalists say, are we destined to be stuck in a Hobbesian war of all coins against all until one coin, uh, coin wins and we have one single global cryptocurrency? So for me, I mean, I absolutely believe in uh, crypto pluralism. I think different communities are going to have different coins for different needs um, and that work in different contexts. So I don't believe in a winner takes all kind of model. Um, but I do think that they can collaborate and work together. Mm. Uh, I also agree. I think that um, one of the things that we don't see yet, um, but we'll probably see more in the future, are things like local currency coins or local um, local municipal DAOs and so on, and every one of those, uh, they may not all have their own chain, but you know, they, they will be their own community that is distinct from other communities. So this, I think that's just one example that, that, shows that, uh, that shows me that there will be many chains. I agree. I, I don't think uh, a winner-take-all future is really viable. You know, we all live our lives as parts of different communities already with different values. I don't see that changing in the blockchain and crypto space. So what, so one thing that, that, uh, the, that I heard there is kind of talking about communities and values, right? And this is not a language that you normally hear people kind of use to talk, to talk about like currencies, right? Like you don't normally hear people saying, oh, I US, use US dollars because I support US dollar values and I'm going to switch to euros because down with US imperialism or I'm going, I'm going to switch to like renminbi or yen or whatever other currency. Like, this is not something that happens right now. Right? Yet. And I mean, people don't even do this with stocks, right? Like you don't even hear uh, that much of people saying, you know, I love, I'm, I love Apple, so I'm going to buy Apple stock. Like it kind of happens, but like, not too much. So is the, I guess, why do we expect this will change? I think it actually is tribal, uh -huh. uh, right? So we have, we have our own currencies that work in our kind of own way in our different contexts. It's just that the, the tribalism historically maybe has been physical more maybe than, than digital. And so maybe that dynamic is, is what's changed. Mm. Mm. I think we, we haven't had maybe the, the technology, and we still don't have the UX for, for a large number of people to use multiple coins and for there to be competition among coins mm. and for like people in the United States to to support one coin versus the other. Certainly the, the regulations don't allow it yet, but I think this will change as um, the, the industry matures and um, uh, as, as it's adopted by the community despite uh, what the powers that be might want. So, but I don't know when, hopefully within the next three years. Okay. So, I guess um, kind of turning things a, um, a bit, we can talk a bit about the like, technical collaboration, right? So our different uh, communities have their own different out of blockchains that they're working on, but we also end up sharing a lot of tech, right? So for example, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic share a large portion of the uh, of the tech stack in Ethereum and Zcash, oh, Zcash is based on ZK Snarks and Ethereum heavily employs ZK Snarks and Cosmos shares um, a lot of uh, cryptography. 
So, do you think we're kind of doing a good enough job of uh, kind of coordinating on how we improve the te the technologies that are shared between us? And if not, what are some things you think we can do better on? I think we could do a much better job. I think uh, you know many <clears throat> blockchains are facing the same fundamental questions, and I think uh, many of us uh, are trying to reinvent the wheel. I think we can identify those questions and work on them together. Mm -hmm. uh, one one of the things I totally agree, and to add to that, <clears throat> I think uh, one thing I learned along this journey is that. Um, if you can define a protocol of, of, of communication between uh, two components of a tech stack, for example, or like if you consider tech stack for a blockchain, there are so many components. And if you can well define the protocol or the interface between these components, then like you can have different communities responsible for um, their flavor of implementation. And so you can have competition for a module or component, but ultimately all working towards a whole because it's pluggable. Um, so I've, I've, I've experienced that once, and we're trying to also push for that in, in, in other regards, like with, uh, with our consensus engine Tendermint, with the ABCI protocol, for example, but it's also you know, obviously in Ethereum with the uh, API and so on already exists as well. I think it's helpful to be intentional, right, rather than pass so, so passively, um, you know, we can borrow technology and, and that kind of thing, but um, but we can accelerate much more when we're intentional. So, you know, getting Blake 2 added to assemble um, and work between Zcash and the, um, and the Electric Coin Company, I think is hugely important for the allowing interoperability in the future so you can use Zcash within, um, within DeFi. Um, that's unlocking some, you know, some other things, some potential um, with, with work on flight client, potential integration with uh, with Cosmos, um, for example, um, but those those interactions and those um, conversations don't happen um, passively. They happen generally when um, people are in the same room together and they're able to kind of sit down and think, um, and they're thinking about selfishly about their own project that they're working on. Um, but the magic can happen and the collisions can happen when when folks get in the room. Mm -hmm. So. If we suppose that, like, imagine a future where our communities are collaborating more, what are some kind of positive results that you could uh, kind of imagine or hope to get out of that? Well, Zcash being embedded in smart contracts, um, so you're able to, to um, in the places where you need that, that kind of privacy, um, that that's there to the extent that like things like ZK Snark and some of the research that our cryptographers are doing, um, and being able to use that within Ethereum independent of Zcash, I think is super cool. Um, so for me, th those are a couple. But. I'd love to see a more intentional organization that brings various um, communities or representatives or people from various communities to, to start to have these conversations, like you mentioned. Um, uh, Ethereum is playing it uh, for the crypto community to a large extent today. Um, maybe we can uh, reach, well, how do we reach out to all the projects? What, what is that association? Yeah. So uh, I'd love to see something like that. Um, uh, I think Ethereum's like kind of set the standard for that, mm. right? Of bringing all of kind of these disparate um, developers and projects and, and things like that together. It's been phenomenal. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of the bar that has been set, I think, for the community. How, how is it that? Yeah. How is it that, it, I guess, yeah, now I'm asking one question. How is it that Ethereum um, is able to do this, whereas like other projects don't? How is Ethereum able to do collaboration, whereas other projects don't? Yeah, so, like how is it that Ethereum is better able to collaborate with disparate, like many projects? Hmm. I mean, part of it, I think, might be just the fact that Ethereum has had a kind of anti-maximalist ethos kind of from the start. Hmm. Like, in the case of like Bitcoin, there's definitely more of this culture of like, e this is the legit coin, or these are the legit coins, and if you're not a legit coin, then like, you're a scam. And I mean, the Ethereum community has its own opinions about what's a legit coin and what's a scam, but I feel like it's kind of broader and kind of broad, broad, broad enough to allow kind of collaboration among technically good projects to happen. So just 
Like recognizing the legitimacy of different approaches is the first step to cooperating with different approaches. Mm. Mm. I think the other thing that would be cool is like if, if beyond kind of technology collaboration, we figured out how to do a better job of um, working on things like product market fit or things out in the field mm -hmm. um, where we're engaging together with the community to reach populations and to, to try to solve uh, specific use cases where we're not really doing that today. We kind of, or it doesn't feel like it maybe. We're kind of coming together and we talk about this stuff and we engage technically, but um, mm -hmm. when it comes to kind of actual execution on the ground, um, there's a, a little bit less of that, that kind of collaboration. I, I think greater collaboration speaks to the way in which blockchains have to grow. I mean, you know, we don't expect to get a corporate strategy plan that's costly and printed and everybody follows it. This is an iterative creative process for which there may not be any one single right answer. And so to do that, you need an increasingly diverse community with increasingly diverse ideas and, and debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One question I have is, um, Every time I fly, I feel guilty because of, of the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the crypto community uh, requires uh, a lot of flying in order to meet. And like yes. you mentioned, being in the same place is what makes the magic happen. Mm -hmm. But I feel like for us to scale to a larger community, like at some point we're going to have to figure out how to make this work without flying. And, but I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, I mean, the thing you would, we would need is more kind of grassroots, uh, kind of local level interoperability. Like, what should Ethereum Japan and Cosmos Japan be talking to each other more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the, the, you know, for friends, and we're already in Japan. Should we be, should, should we be chatting, or at least mm -hmm. those of us who are in Japan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, same with Korea, same with like Taiwan, same with mm, China, same with anything. Um, so, regarding the kind of um, community um, aspects um, of in interoperability, I guess. well, actually, so one other question we have is like we talked about there, there's technology and there's a kind of collaboration because of shared technology, and there's also this idea that of different coin coins and different blockchain communities stand for different values and like ideologies. I guess maybe to start off, like what are some of the key things that, I, that you would describe each of your commu communities as standing for? Mm. You start. Uh, well, I think Ethereum Classic was originally defined as a statement about governance. Um, mm. And it wasn't really technical at all. Mm. It's since taken on a technical agenda and that'll become stronger over time. I think at the moment, and this is something that's evolving, right? I think at the moment, it feels very closely tied to the idea of immutability, even though that's not exclusive to Ethereum Classic, mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of security, so that you could foresee a chain that um, focuses more on maybe transaction finality and larger, fewer transactions than you know mm -hmm. more smaller transactions. So uh, on Twitter yesterday, I think Bob Summerwell described ETC as being uh, if e e ETH technology and BTC values. I mean, do you agree with that characterization? Do you think it's more complicated than that? Uh, I mean, I understand the ETH technology part. I don't understand the, the values he's referring to. Um, hmm. I would say it's different. I think the, the community itself is distinct. Mm -hmm. Characterized by that that um, ability to move in a different direction around governance, mm -hmm. um, and and that's historical. And now trying to position the community in a way that enables it to collaborate. I, mm -hmm. I think I would position us really as being in a place where we're looking to collaborate very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, for Cosmos, maybe the key value is interoperability. Um, we do other things too. Um, like like uh, offering security in the consensus algorithm and, and, and making the making sure that the hub is permissionless, but uh, the core product of the Cosmos hub is about connecting to other blockchains um, and creating protocols for interoperability between blockchains. Um, so interop, um, yeah, and sovereignty. So giving groups their own blockchains communities, their own sovereignty, their own ability to dictate um, and decide what happens on that blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, I mean, for us, ultimately, it's freedom. 
I mean, we get, Zcash is classified as a privacy coin, but you can't have freedom without, um, without privacy or the option to privacy to be able to protect um, uh, what's, what's yours. Like I've been talking about like a friend of mine, Mo, who is uh, a Syrian refugee. And Mo uh, had a business, had bank accounts in Syria, um, family, family homes, and uh, was forced to leave because he was protesting and the government locked down everything. So he no longer had self-sovereignty over his own, his own money. Um, and the government can see all of that stuff, right? They can see all of it because they control it and it's in their context and they have access to the bank accounts and all that kind of thing. So when he moved, he had to move to Jordan, he had to rebuild his life and that's when he got into cryptocurrency and he's like, I need, um, I need to be able to protect my wealth. Um, I need that freedom and I need to be able to do it private, privately because I don't trust any of these kind of government entities to, um, to have access and, and visibility. And then the other things, like we talk even, it's, it's a personal security, but it's also business security, um, and it's even national security. So we've seen the impact of data um, being used by a foreign actor in Russia trying to influence another foreign actor in the US um, based upon the manipulation of the population from data that they collected. And so it's a national security imperative that, that governments actually mandate some you know, privacy for, for citizens. Um, and so that's what we're, we're uh, that's kind of some of the core, core values that we have, I guess. As a, as a I see an interesting disparity between the answers here. Josh's answer is about kind of Zcash's values with respect to kind of concerns that people in the broader world would have, whereas your two answers were more about like this is our, these are the values that our blockchain expresses with respect to other blockchains or with respect to the blockchain space. Um, so I guess, like, first of all, do either of you disagree with freedom and privacy? <laughs> no. Um, no, um, I don't disagree with it, um, but, but I think each of these are nuanced, right? Okay. So, um, so privacy, for example, like, how do you... I think the thing that we don't know yet, and, and the thing that we should try to answer um, from an ethics point of view of designing, you know, answering the question of what should we design for, of course, we want to enable privacy, but if we enable complete privacy of transactions and account balances, how can that be abused in such a way that, um, that, that may not be easy to abuse today? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's one argument to say that, for example, terrorist funding uh, is more, much easier with, with US, USD cash, for example. That's what they use. But, however, um, <laughs> If, if, if you make the USD cash uh, or, um, really easy to transport, then it just becomes that much easier as well to, to um, conduct private terrorist transactions. That's just one example, but I feel like... Jay, so it's the internet, right? The internet made it easier for terrorism. The internet made it easier for terrorism. Because they could pass, pass information along peer-to-peer -peer or whatever without any kind of central control. Um, but there's no argument to kind of expose or make all of that visible. And, and the opposite is, is true. Like we have now mandated basically HTTPS everywhere. Um, we're fed up with all of these kind of honeypot databases where everybody's collecting individual social you know, uh, data that could be hacked by um, China or whatever third party. Um, so it's not like any of these tools could be used for, for terrorism. True. Um, though maybe, um, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing, uh, I don't know what the answer is, I, uh, I, I don't know what the answer is, I'm exploring it, but like at least with sites, like I can choose not to associate with this site, for example, but when you're talking about uh, 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 privacy preserving money, if I don't want to support you, uh, a currency that is being used by terrorists, as an example, I feel like I won't. I wouldn't have a choice if we designed the system wrong. So yeah, I think. I guess my point is, we just need to be cognizant of how we design these systems so that we don't get locked into a system accidentally. Uh, Terry, do you disagree with privacy and freedom? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, I think you know they're essential for the kind of economic independence that we're trying to build. So. 
like in cases where there's kind of different emphasized values, one thing that's sometimes worth kind of sorting out is is it just a difference in priorities? So like, for example, I might imagine that like, Ethereum people are clearly not into privacy. I mean, we even have tornado.cash now, but like when choosing between kind of like universal general, like, like generalizability and privacy, Ethereum is clearly going universal generalizability first, whereas Zcash is going privacy first, but like there's not a big incompatibility. Like, there, there doesn't seem to be a big incompatibility because like if, if you can, have both event eventually been great. But other times you might have like, values that are more incompatible with each other, right? So like, for example, in the case of Ethereum, well, we like proof of stake and Ethereum classic people like proof of work and like, Ethereum people seem to like, sh uh, like sharding more and we feel like layer one scalability is important, whereas EDC people uh, feel that you know, the security trade-offs are too much for that. So, do you think there's kind of many in... So one of the properties um, of uh, kind of trade-offs that are kind of just differences in priorities is that if it's just a matter of differences in priorities, then in the long run, we might end up just kind of building the same thing. Like one person goes north first and then east, the other person goes east and then first and then north, but you still end up northeast. Do you think there's a possibility we'll just end up building the same thing in um, in ten years' time? I, there's a there's a possibility, but we're so so diverse as people and so opinionated. I'm not I'm not sure how um, you know from a governance perspective how that happens. There may be some uh, like back we're talking about murders or whatever, but there may be some um, some of that kind of activity. Um, but in some places, it just makes sense, right? So some of the separation makes sense. So Zcash was was a fork off of Bitcoin was, um, because Bitcoin Core didn't want to add um, the the cryptography on top of Bitcoin. It was too novel. Uh, they were worried about it, you know, disrupting the network. And so this other coin was born. And this other coin, Zcash, then can explore, um, you know, different kinds of applications and properties that that it, you know they couldn't do on Bitcoin. So that's, I think, it's a healthy dynamic. And whether those two like ever come back together, uh, I don't know. But um, well, there's value in the diversity. If they do come back together, do you think coin mergers are possible? Do you think they're a good idea? I think it's super interesting. But it, for me, it's like this. Like two jet planes, like trying to kind of come together um, in the middle and and sort a whole bunch of stuff out. And so, um, I think when that happens, I think it will happen. Um, I think it will be interesting as as kind of a, an experiment in the um, in the space. I'm not quite sure the mechanics of how it would work, but I feel like maybe it's more likely to happen if uh, if they're working on different directions such that and, and they complement each yeah. other then and if these projects had like governance or decision making uh, legitimate uh, legitimate decision making systems um, such that uh, it's clear that they agree to do a coin merger then yeah. I suppose and we're talking for clarity we're talking about layer one coins merging not yes. like two other like two ERC 20 token mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think it's quite likely that uh, we don't end up in the same place at all. Hmm. And I think that's because the, you know, the values as, as expressed in technological choices will result in different usage. Mm -hmm. And I think over time what could happen is that certain coins and certain stacks are seen as you know, the best for certain type use cases. Hmm. And you, know, you go to one chain for one type of transaction, you go to another chain for a different type of transaction. Um, do you think Zcash and Monero have uh, different uses? Um, I, I don't. I don't think they have different uses. I think mo with both of them, the intent is for the coin. If I understand Monero correctly, to be used as a medium, ultimately as a medium of exchange, mm -hmm. um, to not have broad-based kind of some programmability, but not like Turing complete programmability at, at, at layer one. I mean, the, I think the core kind of what we're trying to accomplish is really similar. And it's actually really interesting because like online or on Twitter, if you view if you see Twitter, it looks very combative, like these two projects are just at each other. And, and that's not the reality. You have certain actors that um, kind of play that up. But um, like at, at Zcon 1, the last Zcash conference we had uh, in Monero, I don't remember the Monero conference was in, in, in Denver, but we had like a co-panel. Um, between the between the two projects, and so there's a lot that's 
um, that's actually mm -hmm. shared. Do you think uh, the Zcash and Monero communities have different values? I think some values are different, yes. Such as? Um, I think that um, the, the, so like for, for how, for, for example, some of the governance and how funding decisions are made mm -hmm. and whether or not there's alignment of mm -hmm. um, coin holders with developers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, the user grants program, right now Zcash is funded off chain. And so the, the question is, is like how much um, is necessary to secure the network versus how much should be used to fund development? Is that the right kind of model? So Zcash uh, community largely believes that that's the right kind of model. Uh, the incentives align between the coin holders and, and the developers where Monero uh, doesn't share that, that same. Yeah. So like one thing I've noticed as a kind of possible general, general trend is that like developers are generally like seem to be more willing to be friendly with each other than kind of community members are. And one reason I feel this might be the case is that developers often do have kind of aligned interests in that developers see each other as both just building cool stuff and they want to see cool stuff built. Whereas coin holders, like if you're a Zcash coin holder, you want Zcash to succeed and you ain't got no Monero. And if you're a Monero coin holder, then like, you want Monero to, to, to succeed. And like some people might have both, but lots of them, you know, ain't got no Zcash. And, even in the uh, Ethereum community, you know, like some of the more kind of maximalist push that we've seen is, com uh, is coming from people who uh, aren't uh, the developers. So are there risks that could happen if kind of developer communities are aligned but broader communities are not aligned? Yeah, probably the developers will get outcast. Mm -hmm. I don't see how that's possible, though. I mean, at the end of the day, the developers are the ones building the chain. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the question is, what's the tolerance or elasticity of debate within a particular community? Mm -hmm. um, if the developers have a, a significant disagreement with the community, well, they can fork. Mm -hmm. If the community has a significant disagreement with the developers, they could buy a different coin. Um, I'm not sure where that line is, and I think it varies depending on the issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll get easier for uh, a community that disagrees with the developers to um, to fork it and to um, create structure with DAOs, just like elect people, and then kind of if you have the right DAO system, I feel like this developer, new developer network might be able to evolve and mature. Mm. Um, How are you defining community? Who is, is it? Does it sound like it was like coin holders, developers, but is the community broader than coin holders and developers? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And and hopefully in time it becomes even much broader to really users. Um, but I think at the moment, at least in the debates we have, there's a, a kind of almost bilateral debate where you know there are folks who who aren't developers, and you know, and then there are folks who are, and there's that that interaction between the two. Mm -hmm. So one other dynamic I've noticed is that I sometimes get the feeling that, like, strangely enough, collaboration may be more possible when ideologies are more incompatible. Um, so like, one example of this is that even if you look at kind of Ethereum, Ethereum and like, Ethereum Classic in the long term, then in the long term, like, sharding gives much greater layer one throughput than not doing sharding. And proof of stake gives a different security model than proof of work. And there's people that are kind of diehard proof of work people that are not going to do proof of stake. And sharding like legitimately makes security trade offs compared uh, compare to not doing sharding that some people don't want to accept. And so one kind of effect that comes out of this is that of both communities might even feel safer because there's we know that there is kind of one base that's going to use one thing and it's not going and it's not willing to switch to the other thing because the trade-offs are just unacceptable like it's not even like better or worse it's just like what one side thinks is better as the, uh, is view from the perspective of the other side is making things worse. And so one side's going to stay over here, the other side's going to stay over here, and that actually like, could make it, people feel like collaboration is possible because there, like, we know that there's no risk of one side fully eating the other side. Would you, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's more complicated? 
No, I, I would agree with it. Certainly in, in the case of Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, uh, you know, as Ethereum is moving to 2.0, we've taken the opportunity to, uh, you know, reiterate our commitment to proof of work mm -hmm. and then start to figure out how we can complement uh, each other in that space. Um, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a corollary or takeaway is that um, if you if you take a community and you segment them into distinct um, ideologies and you, you define sub communities, maybe maybe it can accelerate the, the growth of this project if you can do it the right way. Uh, sometimes it's so ideologically misaligned that it just can't happen, right? So if you have so if there was a, a nation state that wanted to create a digital concurrency with the intent of completely surveilling and manipulating their people, then that would be incongruent with our mission. And we just wouldn't do it. We just couldn't work together, independent of that. Um, okay. So we know that cryptocurrencies are going to exist as a category and fiat currencies are going to exist as a category, but will there be more than two coins? Okay, different fiats disagree, so there'll be multiple fiats, but are there, like, can we come up with more examples of kind of pairs of cryptocurrencies where it's kind of just obvious that one direction is different from the other direction and they'll both continue to, uh, continue to exist? I can't think of any others at the moment. Hmm. You can't? No, I can't. Be so any others between like Ethereum and Bitcoin? Well, I mean, I guess at a macro level, but but how much uh, you know tangible cooperation is taking place? Hmm. There, there's cooperation taking. I'd say there's cooperation taking place, kind of implicitly, even between Ethereum and Bitcoin. Like we're using, in some case, the same sec p fifty six k one libraries. Hmm. So, you you get it. You get such a thing with staking tokens um, if you need distinct validator sets and mm. especially for regional validator sets but mm. maybe mm. you might have uh, validators with different ideas of how to secure their system and so on so for all each of these staking sets they would have their own staking token as well but it's not clear to me what the market cap ratio would be between staking tokens and cryptocurrency cash tokens mm. I could, I could see the kind of privacy and generality trade-off as being kind of not 100% 100, 100 resolvable as well. Mm. Privacy and? Privacy and generality. Like you could imagine general purpose privacy, but like there's, there's trade-offs that you have to make there. Mm -hmm. mm. Like one example of this is that Zcash believes in kind of forcing everything to be private, whereas like we're more of a hey we're a, hey we're a legal box like you do what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so think it's, it's an optionality, right? So you should have the option to be able to disclose or not disclose, right? Um, and then, but the, you know, there's all kinds of arguments as to why you need openness, whether it's um, things like auditability or things that maybe can be be solved with with technology. But um, I don't know. Is there is there are there maximalists out there that believe that privacy shouldn't happen it should just be completely completely open system i am um, i was just like uh, at present uh, visiting like korea for a week and i got at least five media people asking me questions of the form like don't you think privacy will enable criminals mm -hmm. so yeah I know there's pe people definitely exist in the blockchain communities mm -hmm. hmm. it's i mean I'm sure you're aware of your own coin being delisted from a couple of exchanges. I am, largely because of misunderstandings yeah. and some banking concerns, but yeah. no, 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 don't, don't worry, I put, up, I put up with a good fight for you guys there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, actually that brings up another, uh, another point, which is there's, a, like, aside from kind of tech and applications, a third frontier of kind of possible collaboration is kind of outreach to the broader public, which could, inc and it could include regulators, it could include kind of pu getting public legitimacy in general. Um, do you think there's more that we could do on that side? Yeah, I 100% believe there's more that, that we can do on that side. And in some cases, like I had referenced earlier, the kind of the need to be out kind of in the community and some of the stuff, we're, we're running some pilots where we're 
um, pulling in different projects together to collectively um, educate. Like the, the initial pilot we ran was was in the South Bronx to, co to collectively educate um, um, students and what we learned about uh, the use of, of, uh, of cryptocurrency in the South Bronx is um, per capita the least unbanked uh, population in the U.S. Um, the reality is, is like what, once we got engaged there, all of us came away completely blown away by the insight of the students that we were kind of engaging with, and they flipped the script um, on us. Um, but that was a project that you know brought together uh, like Casa, who like doesn't support Zcash, for example, um, Jim and I, Flexa, a number of uh, Masari, a number of projects kind of came together on these kind of efforts. Um, and I would love to be able to you know, see more of that kind of active um, collaboration. What, one thing that was interesting in terms of regulators, and sometimes it's really, it's really difficult, is OKX, like OKX had said that they were gonna delist de Zcash. Um, and then yesterday, um, uh, I got a message from them saying, we've decided to put this on hold, uh, and we're putting this on hold uh, while we do further, further investigation. It had to do with FATF travel rule requirements. Um, but it was both Zcash and Dash. But we didn't collaborate but we went in separately and had separate kinds of conversations. But I think it would have actually been, um, even though there's some ideological disagreement between Zcash and Dash, I think there, it would have been beneficial for us to kind of collectively game plan on um, how we work together to, to provide um, you know, additional information, new information to regulators that can make uh, better decisions. Um, one aspect of um, the community outreach that, that um, some of us are exploring is, for example, working with um, uh, people who are, or a community of people who are interested in like ethical software or how to make sure that we design for ethical systems. Um, and I think broadly, in general, maybe the question we should be asking, or I feel like the question that I should be asking is like, you know, what kind of monetary system should we, we be designing for the future? And I think that comes with so many questions and communities that have different opinions already about what to do there. So there's a need to um, reach out to those communities and not necessarily like indoctrinate them with blockchain, but like understand um, all these nuances so that we can better design um, our future. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot more outreach we can do, and, and really in two ways. One, to the general public, I think there's still a lot of misconceptions in the general public about what blockchain is, what it can do, what people do with it. Uh, and the second is, you know, really engaging certain participants in the ecosystem who don't typically, uh, you know, participate, say, in a forum like this. We spend a lot of time engaging with regulators, with exchanges, with custodians, uh, because they actually can have a significant impact on the ability of the technology to see wider adoption. And there's a lot more education that I think needs to be done there about uh, what the strengths and weaknesses of the technology are and what the roadmap is. Just wanted to bring up um, a tangent. Um, you know, so we have different ideologies or communities representing different ideologies. Um, I feel like what we, well, not just us, but the world needs to get better at is allowing these communities with opposing views to have discourse together. Yeah. Um, and I haven't really seen good software or interfaces to allow this to happen, but it's like, wouldn't it be great if you can have uh, a long running discussion where the end result is like almost a conversation but between representatives of two communities such that then anyone from both sides can read and understand all the nuances. I feel like that would maybe help us transcend a lot of good work. And at the end of the day, though, like are, I'm sure there's there's limits on like what, what we will end up agreeing on, mm -hmm. and that's good. Like that's why multiple platforms exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, is there a, I guess, um, if there is kind of one kind of one simple thing that we can start doing more of just to kind of get the benefits of, collab of uh, kind of collaborating, reduce the harms of, uh, of anti-collaborating um, over, uh, over the next few months, at least like, between our communities, like, 
is there any kind of one simple um, example of something we can do that, pop, that pops out in your head? So I'd like to see more kind of uh, working groups. Again, like I think yeah. Ethereum um, in, in this kind of community is, is fantastic and welcoming and warm and there's a kind of all this opportunity for collisions. But I think if we're more intentional, like for, um, like for us in the Ethereum Foundation, for example, to be able to have uh, regular um, times where the core, like cryptographers, developers, and engineers can come together, kind of work through ideas and plans, invite, inviting other folks like, you know, um, uh, Matt was in here earlier from Thesis, um, or other people in the community, and kind of lay these kind of ideas out there, and then also look and collectively work on funding mechanisms to allow for some of these other um, kind of potential uh, contributors um, that can provide some of the glue between, um, between these communities. Uh, I think that would be great as well. Um, I guess one is enabling communities to have a voice um, in the likeness of what I just mentioned, like having discourse. Um, so maybe there are other things that can happen by enabling a voice for a community. The other thing I, I, I ask myself often is, uh, uh, we need to physically meet in order for this kind of you know, uh, dialogue to happen, but how do we scale it so that we don't necessarily have to travel? And if we can crack that, I feel like we would have uh, a much more rapid iteration or rate of discovery. I, I agree with that, and I would simply add, uh, Stop trying to debate complex topics on Twitter. <laughs> Just yeah. stop. Can we debate complex topics on Reddit? <laughs> I feel like it's better, but it's still centralized. What about memo.cache? Memos on cache? No, yeah, it's like this thing where you just like dump comments on the Bitcoin cache blockchain and it's okay because they have 32 megabytes or something. <laughs> <laughs> Great collaboration. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.